um, I can see still a loading, 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 loading. Um, I'll monitor YouTube for comments as well, uh, Ismail. Brilliant, thank you. Um, welcome everyone to your graduation of OLS from OLS 6, sixth cohort of Open Life Science. Um, congratulations on uh, what has been an exciting uh, 15, 16 weeks so collaborating, finding new collaborations, uh, having awesome conversations with different people and learning from one another. Today we're going to celebrate the work you've done. We'll have pres five presentations in total um, from uh, Dadio, Alden, Elena, Jennifer. Um, so that's five in total, so you'll have five minutes each. We have plenty of time. We'll have some time for questions and comments right after each presentation. If there are any technical difficulties, send me a message. I'm happy to share screens if I need to or anything like that. Um, unless I'm missing anything enormous, shall we go to the first presentation? Dadio, that's you. I'm ready, yes. Okay. I, I will share my, my screen, all right? Super. All right. Thank you very much, Ismail. My name is Dario Bassett. Okay, you should see my screen. Yes. Okay, right. Okay, that's my presentation. Now we try to stay within five minutes. You see my name. Okay, right. I, uh, sorry for my English. I think I'm a little bit rusty with the English, so okay. But uh, if you don't understand, I'm very sorry. I will repeat. Uh, uh, okay, I'm Italian. We, um, we can, sorry, Dadio, we can see the um, speaker view, so we see both the screen and your notes. Uh, okay, so, okay, so let me, okay, but the notes are, are okay. Oh, my God, how can I get out of this? Okay, let me go this way. I don't mind, so. Okay, I will not present uh, the, the usual presentation, but just uh, go through the slides in this way. Okay. 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 So go for my name. My name is Dario Bassett. My mentor is Alessandra Candian. I don't know if she's, if she's uh, present or not. But first of all, I would like to thank her. Uh, she was really, really uh, careful. And she was uh, great. And. Uh, the first thanks it goes to Alessandra. By the way, Alessandra is Italian like me, so uh, and, and and especially Italian. Not only we are from the same country, but also from the same region. You see that our family name is uh, cut at the end and doesn't have. They they do not have any vocal, which is not usual for the Italian, because we come from the same region, which is Veneto, where is Venetia and so on. But that's a curiosity. So I will go on. My project is uh, about quality of data. And uh, this is the same project that I presented uh, in uh, Genoa. I know there is Elena that uh, uh, knows this because Elena was in Genoa week uh, uh, in, uh, in November. So uh, it's uh, say the following of this project. Uh, the, the project is taking care of the quality and, the, and first of all, let's define what quality is. And the quality is very difficult to, to explain because uh, it depends on, it, it is, let's say, it is subjective. Uh, so uh, finally, I, I, uh, we have a problem. We have a problem with uh, fair data, with data that is deposited in our uh, repository, which is Dataverse. So we try to check the quality of the data with, uh, let's say, a semi-automatic tools, and that's the scope of my project. We also made uh, some uh, other actions in order to um, try to, to, to have a better data on the uh, deposited, uh, like uh, make some... We, we do um, monthly training. We, do, we also wrote some uh, useful guidelines you can find in our, in our site. Uh, but also I added that this kind of uh, automatic, semi-automatic control of the data which is published. And I will uh, try to, under, to, to, to explain what quality is. Okay, for quality, of course, we have 
uh, we could uh, spend uh, hours talking about data quality and metadata quality. And we try to be, let's say, short on this because otherwise it is going to be, let's say, <laughs> uh, an, an, an argument which is too long. So I tried to simplify following the International Standard Organization uh, um, declaration about uh, the six uh, most important uh, characteristic of uh, quality. And uh, okay, you find uh, uh, the explanation of this in English, of course, in a document that you will find in my, in my uh, GitHub, uh, which is the last slide. Um, in the last slide, I will uh, tell you what is uh, where is the, the GitHub that I uh, produced. And uh, uh, you will find the document uh, explaining what is accuracy, what is completeness, what is consistency and validity, uniqueness and timeliness. Of course, uh, these are, um, let's say, uh, features that are more or less clear to everybody. But anyway, there is a, let's say, a clear definition of each one of these in the document. Let's talk a little bit about what is uh, the program about. The program is a batch program that I run uh, each uh, couple of weeks. And the batch program is checking through the uh, database API uh, what is the metadata and what uh, if the metadata is good. And this is what I call completeness requirement. If the, the let's say, the data set is well positioned, if the requirements for data access are uh, well defined, and also if there are some uh, good uh, uh, specification about the user, so how many administrator and so on. So this is uh, a set of check that is possible to, to carry on in a, an automatic way. Of course, there are some other checks, but uh, I have to limit, uh, uh, say, the automatic run. Otherwise, it's going to last, uh, let's say, hours. OK. So for example, I run the, um, the check. The last run that I made in uh, two weeks ago was uh, about uh, scanning 162 data sets which are the data set that are published. All the others are not published. And so I don't check uh, the data set that are not, are not published. I don't uh, find any data set with severe issue according to my uh, severity uh, score. And I find uh, some data set with warning, for example, that uh, there is no uh, uh, readme inside the data set. So this is, for example, uh, an output. Yes, please. Uh, just to note, that's five minutes. So if you could try to wrap it up, sorry. Right. Okay. I I skip I uh, uh, the results and I go to this because this is the most important slide and uh, this is the slide that, that uh, documents my experience with OLS six. You see that there are some uh, important. Um, uh, point in time, for example, uh, the meeting that I have done, uh, the, some uh, particular, uh, um, uh, let's say, meeting that I have done with you about accessibility was really outstanding. And when you talk about code style, preprints, and uh, also FAIR, but the FAIR, of course, I know already. So uh, this is the, um, the document, uh, the, the description of my my let's say experience with all six a lot of uh, let's say knowledge that is growing and you see this this, this uh, qualitative uh, uh, graphics uh, so uh, I think you can uh, you can uh, check here okay this is my next steps uh, and that is all I think uh, I don't have any any other um, any other things to, to tell you. Of course, I have uh, this GitHub uh, to tell you, and uh, this is the GitHub uh, repository that I produced. And so it's going to be uh, available to you whenever you, you, you need. Okay, that's it. That's all. Thank you very much for, for uh, your attention, and I, I close here. Brilliant. Thank you, Dadio. Uh, virtual round of applause, everyone.
Ah, see my face on my on the screen is strange. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right, that's I, just, that's just me. I stop. Um, I stop. Brilliant. Well done. Again, round of applause now that we can see each other. Um, <laughs> Daddy, it would be really helpful on line 51. There's a there's a there's a point where I'm answering the question, how can others help? It would be really helpful if you could put the, your GitHub repository link there. Yes, okay. I would put it there. Right now. Um I think we have a moment for a couple of questions. Yes, please. Um, so I'll, I'll read them from the etherpad that have been already shared. So that tool looks really interesting. Are there any plans to compare, combine it with some of the fair assessment tools out there, such as F Fuji? Fuji? Sorry, is that a question for me? Yeah, that was for you. So are there any awesome. um, uh, plans to combine it with other fair assessment tools such as Fuji? Uh, I don't know Fuji, and so I, 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 I'm not really expert about this. So um, maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know at the moment, of course. I am quite new to this, and uh, this is a, a job that I carried out uh, uh, comparing my my work with um, with some people that you see in the presentation uh, here, for example, um, a data curator from Yang, uh, from um, uh, Oil University, and some some other people. So uh, I don't know. I I don't know how to. I don't know if uh, there is a plan for this. Of course, I would like to because uh, you know. I need I need to to check if there are some other features to to add to this work, so, but I don't know. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm guessing people can reach out if you want to uh, think about that more. Maybe, maybe. Um, we'll go to the next question, and I'm I'm sticking yes, to the. I'm sticking to the etherpad. I know Elena, you have. Um, uh, I see there are there is at least one question in the chat as well, but I'll stick to the etherpad. Yeah. Uh, the next one is for you, Dadio. How often do you envision uh -huh. other? Uh, do you envision users using the tool to assess their data quality? If there is a serious issue, what is the next step they could take? Yeah, the next step is 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 uh, is send an email to the author of the, that, that's the, the way to, 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 let's say, to fix the problem. If there is a serious problem, or even a, a, a not a serious problem, uh, you, can, uh, you can have, of course, uh, the, the details of the problem and send an email asking the author to fix. Because it's not something that you should fix yourself. You should give some uh, recommendation on how to fix the problem. Is that okay? Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't get the uni talk before. Uh, now I understand because I see the the, the um, let's say uh, the, the, the the written part from uh, Elena. So uh, uni talk is University of Torino, I think, right? So of course I'm glad to work to to help. Of course, yes. Brilliant. Um, is it time for one more question. Shall we go? Yes, to the next? please. I, I, I think, think we'll we we'll go to the next on. one. Um, yeah. Uh, because it's yeah, we we have so many cool presentations to to listen to. Yeah. One final round of applause for Dario. Thank um, you. Very I raised my voice there. That I don't know how that comes across on uh, on on video. <laughs> um, but again, congratulations, Sadio. Great work. Okay. Um, We'll go next to Saranjeet. Now, Saranjeet, I'm sharing the screen. So give me a moment. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, hopefully this works. Can you see Saranjeet's presentation? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Um, Sanji, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. 
five minutes, go for it. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Saranjit and I'm pre presenting my project mapping the OLS life science cohorts. Uh, this project was developed and mentored by uh, um, Esther and Fortis and uh, I really like to thank them for being so patient with me because I had a really slow start and it was only uh, around the vacation period uh, in Christmas that I would I, I got to ramp up on the project. So yeah, next slide, please. So my full name is Saranjit Kaur Bhogal. I am the lead and co-founder of the RSC Asia Association. Again, a project that I had started with the Open Life Science Cohort 4. Uh, and since then I have been associated with OLS and with the research software engineering community. Uh, uh, recently, I also uh, got it got the honor to become an uh, international fellow for the Software Sustainability Institute. So uh, I'm looking forward to that too this year. Uh, I'm based in India. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is a country in the Asian continent and we are surrounded by land on the north and by waters on the south, as you can see on the, on the uh, map of India on this slide. Next slide, please. Uh, so my work product is uh, OLS community map. Um, uh, the idea uh, which which is presented on the next slide, um, the next slide, please. So the idea was to build an interactive map of the geogra geographical distribution of the open life science community using uh, the shiny package in R. So uh, I wanted to also upskill myself uh, with shiny skills. And that's why um, this is, and the OLS community was growing uh, cohort by cohort. So I thought this would be a nice idea to uh, use the OLS data and uh, create an interactive map. I've used uh, various packages in R, mainly Shiny, and then some add-on packages like Leaflet, Maps, Dplyr, Country Code, and Tidy Geocoder. Um, the feature of this map, uh, which uh, which I will uh, share uh, in, in the later slides, uh, it it allows you to see the distribution of the OLS community uh, cohort wise, and um, the geographical data that we are using is not. Uh, it is the data of uh, where a community member is affiliated to, and not the um, not the actual location or residence of people. Uh, so it's just the affiliation institution of the community member. And I would I would like to welcome anybody who is interested to contribute to this project. They are free to open an issue on the GitHub repo and reach out to me to discuss further. Um, links to the GitHub repo, uh, the slides and the map are available on the chat. I've pasted them on the Zoom chat now. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is how a uh, static version of the OLS community map looks like. Uh, on the top right, there is a selection, a drop down where you can choose the cohort you want to see. OLS 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 currently. Um, and it shows you where the community members or the institutes that they are affiliated to are located. And it, uh, I'm using a small leaf markers to show those locations. Um, next slide, please. So that's all about my project. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can uh, write to me on my email address or you can uh, uh, check my web page, which is available on the QR code. Uh, and now I would like to, uh, I would request Ismail to share a link to the, I mean, can you share the uh, map uh, and we can show how it works. So yeah, so uh, if you click on the top right um, drop down. Uh, and select a different cohort, say any any other cohort, then it changes and it shows how the OLS community has been evolving uh, through the cohorts. So yeah, this was my project and uh, I would admit that um, it was not a linear growth that I was going through, but it was a lot of, uh, the path was very, uh, it, it was quite fun to uh, do this project. And I also reached out to a few people uh, in the process. Uh, I would also like to thank Anelda, uh, uh, Ben, and all the experts who agreed to uh, share their experiences with me. 
Uh, also, there are a few things that I want to update on this map, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll add those features in the long run. So yeah, if anybody wants to reach out and uh, contribute, uh, please open an issue or write to me on my email. Uh, thank you so much. The virtual round of applause. Congrats. Well done. Um, and I, I do want to share the link to this um, in the chat just so you know you can you can play if you don't have questions, um, play around with it. <laughs> I'm just going to return, sorry, dealing with a couple of screens there. Um, just going to return to the uh etherpad, check any questions for Saranjit. Um so here's one. Can you? Um, here's an interesting feature request. Amazing. Um, so like reading it off the screen. Amazing, Sanjit, um, and very useful for networking. Can you also filter by country? Uh, yeah, I can do that, but um, it, it's possible to filter that. Uh, however, if you are asking me to put it on the map, then uh, if I locate people by country, uh, I'm afraid the markers would be overlapping and it would be, uh, it would not be so clear visually. So that's why I took the city level data to uh, plot the map. Um, however, uh, I can, I can definitely try some summary statistics if people are interested to see that feature country wise. Elena, any, does, did that? Sound fair? If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Thank you. Super. Um, another question. Could you share a bit about what future map features? So anything else that you'd like to add? It's very cool. Okay. So uh like what I'm immediately planning to do is to create different tabs and uh limit the map to like bound the map to a certain region on the web page. Like right now it's quite it 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 moves around if you try to zoom in and then it expands to the whole page. So what I'm trying to do is to uh, at least create boundaries around it and then uh, create different tabs. So the landing tab, the landing page would have this map and the different tabs might have description, which I'm sharing verbally now. So it will have the description of what the actually the data, what the data is getting, uh, is being plot on the map and uh, I might also include one more tab with um, country-wise or continent-wise summary statistics. So uh, different tabs on the page uh, is something that I'm uh, looking to do next. Brilliant. Um, and I'll ask one last question. Is there a possibility to show metadata? Like if you hover over, over a leaf, can we find what the project is? This is super exciting. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm I'm not sure if I can get to the detail of the project, but I can definitely uh, get to the level where I can uh, trace back who the person is, at least their GitHub username. Till there, I can trace back and add it to the marker. But uh, I'll I'll have to learn more how to get the project name or project title. Uh, included with that in the marker. I, I'll have to explore, but yeah, that's that's a really nice feature to have. There are lots of ideas here. It's amazing. Uh, you have the how can other help uh, how can others help link on line 63. So everyone jump on that after the call or, or whenever you have time later on. Um, for now, a final round of applause for Saranjeet. There you go. I, I should have a recording of claps that would make this uh, so much stranger. Um, and we'll go on to the uh, next presentation from Alden. Are you ready to share your screen? Yes. Hi. And present. So now let me go to slideshow. Is that you Brilliant. see the slideshow version? Okay, great. So I have um, retitled my project. I put both projects here, but in, or titles here, but in the end, I'm calling it a holistic perspective on stakeholder engagement. I came in with the title preparing IceNet stakeholder engagement framework for open and collaborative development, um, which is very long and not that great anyway. So uh, my mentor was Mallory Freeberg, who's here. And um, thanks to her for all her help. 
So the motivation behind this, pro this project is um, a project that I work on at the Turing called IceNet. And it's a sea ice forecast currently operational in the Arctic. So that means it has applications for polar scientists or so researchers who are on ships in the Arctic doing research, conservation researchers, because they are interested in animal migration and animals that use the sea ice as a bridge between land and local communities in the polar regions. And so my focus for the OLS project um, really started with, but even centered more over the course of OLS on to thinking about how to communicate with these local indigenous communities. So coming into this, I knew that each of these groups would require different versions of the forecast because they have different reasons for wanting the forecast. So, you know, the polar scientists, they want to track, make routes for their ships so that they can go around the ice. Conservation researchers, again, they're looking at these specific areas where animals use the ice. And then, of course, the indigenous communities, they're going to want to look at the areas near where they live, where the ice will affect their hunting and their travel and other daily life activities. And so, like I said, I entered this thinking I'm going to make a, a platform on GitHub where I can get all this feedback. I can ask everyone to contribute and, and you know, that way find out what each group needs and how, how to make this forecast operational for everyone. And quite quickly, I, I realized, thanks to Mallory's help and, and talking with, with OLS, other people in OLS, and, and I'll get to it, but the expert I spoke to also was, was incredibly helpful, that you know, I shouldn't just assume that the, the open GitHub based process that I'm used to is really going to work for everybody because presumably these indigenous communities don't necessarily have access to GitHub. They don't have laptop. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if, if everyone's got a laptop or if it's going to be, you know, some how much computer access they're going to have, how much internet access they're going to have. And of course, there's also a language barrier. And, you know, we, Obviously, it's great to, to be able to translate things into multiple languages, but in the end, I'm operating in English. I don't have access to, you know, indigenous languages very easily and, and translation. So that's, that's a pretty high barrier, much higher than, than you know, translating into the, the most popular languages in the world. So I, I kind of took a step back and thought, okay, so instead of starting from this perspective of how do I, you know, create a platform so that everyone can participate, I have to say, well, does everyone want to participate? And how am I going to talk to those people and find out what the best way for them to participate is? And so uh, Mallory set me up with, oh, oh, well, sorry, I'm skipping ahead of the slide. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this because I only have five minutes, but I just wanna bring your attention to the care principles, which were um, released by the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. And I've linked here to the principles themselves as well as to a blog post by the Ada Lovelace Institute that discusses how to use them and how to um, how they go well with the FAIR principles. But the CARE principles are collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. And this refers to data governance, particularly in the cases where you are approaching indigenous communities to gather data and use data and, and work with them around data governments. It's a little different in my case. Our data is all satellite-based. It's all of data about the ice. and um, so it's more, in my case, it's more about approaching them to say, okay, what can we do to provide you with this data that in a way that's useful to you? Um, and so then I spoke with uh, Roland Mossbergen, who was really, really great to talk to. And I've, I've linked to his website down here, practicaldiversity.org. And what we talked about was an approach of centering the most marginalized. So this is an advocacy-based approach where you go in as an advocate for the community you're speaking to. And you go in having done some work up front. You can't just go and say, how do you want me to do this? Because that makes them do the work. So you come in with examples and ideas, but understand that these are not necessarily the answers. So these options may work. Here are some ideas. Here's the research I've done to think through this and then get their feedback on whether they think it will work and how they want to change it. Um, not assuming, it's very important to not assume that what's been done before is what works. So you want to, you know, take these examples of what's been done before, but figure out what needs to be improved, and just act as an advocate for the community. And and this was a, a the last point is one that I I found really interesting is, you know, don't assume all parties are happy with the process, even if some are. So if you you find a group that is comfortable and happy with the process that you're working with, that doesn't mean there's not someone else who doesn't isn't you know in appreciating the process or doesn't find it helpful. Um, so it, it's a framework of just always thinking about 
the most marginalized group and, and what they need and how you can um, approach them and, and try to advocate for them. So that's that's yeah. that is five minutes. So if you okay, great. I just have one more slide. So a little bit about going forward. So like I, I said in the last slide, you know, go in doing research, think about language barriers up front, think about a funding plan, particularly for translation, um, is going to be very important. And um, this this work, the actual preparation has been pushed a little bit due to, to grant funding timelines. So I haven't um, started any of this, which is actually really nice because I've had a lot of time to think about it. And so in contrast to how I came in thinking about it, I'm really kind of taking a step back and thinking about that foundation for community outreach and how I have to think beyond the, the technologies I'm comfortable with. So that's all. Excellent, thank you. Again, round of applause and congratulations, Alden. Thanks. Great work uh, during OLS. Um, Line 80 is where you can add any questions for Alden. Um, I would like to ask Alden, um, uh, maybe this is me being a bit naive, but um, are there, is, is there a, in, in the funding process, you just mentioned the need for funding for translation. Is there also going to be a need for funding for actually traveling to the uh, sorts of places you're going to be working with people? That That's a good question. question. Um, working in climate science, you come up against the paradox of net zero and, and you know, actually being on the ground. So it's, it's a hard question and um, one that I think luckily is above my pay grade. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know the... Um, it's a good question. Yeah, it's a good thing to think about, but it is something that I know the British Antarctic Survey, who, who I do this work with, are already struggling with about how they get that on the ground experience. It's really valuable to their research. And obviously, you know, the people actually researching the ice, doing the work have to go there. But how much do we send other people into these places um, while taking into account the, the traveling carbon footprint? It, it is tricky, isn't it? That, that is a paradox there. Um, I, I want to uh, share Umar's question from the chat, which is, uh, in what context did you identify marginalized communities? That's a good question. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to think back to my conversation with Ro Roland, and um, I think that the idea is that there's, there's always some, you know, it's going to depend, it's totally context dependent, right? And that's why the framework is centered the most marginalized, because you need to figure out in your context who is the most marginalized. So in the case of, take for instance, the care principles, the assumption is that indigenous communities have traditionally been marginalized specifically in the context of data use and data gathering. And um, and, and like I said too, one thing that, that um, I talked about with Roland is just because someone you're speaking to is happy with what you're doing doesn't mean there's not someone else and someone who maybe has a different, you know, different intersection of marginalization. Um, but yeah, I would just say it's, it's very context dependent. Brilliant. And one final question, have ISNET, so team upstream, um, incorporated or reflected on fair care principles drawn from your work? Not yet. Um, like I said, this is actually my engagement with the team right now. I, I am engaged with the team, but hopefully with, with this grant, I'll be more 50% time in the group and, and we'll be able to really bring this into the, the thinking of the whole group. But um, but they do, I, I do know that the, even before my engagement, um, they've definitely thought about how to, how to reach out to indigenous, indigenous communities and, and how that needs to be handled um, correctly. And I know that the British Antarctic Survey also is has um, a focus on, on thinking this through. Amazing, thank you. Lots of opportunity for a lot of impact to be made through this project. Final round of applause um, from everyone in the room. There you go. Um, congrats again, Alden, amazing work. Uh, looking forward to how it how it uh, evolves. We'll go to the next presentation now, which is by Elena. Um, and you're already sharing. You're faster than me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So can can you see the slide? I guess. 
Yes, you you, you have it in. Um... Yeah, I know. Okay. Now? Perfect. Okay. So thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for this awesome life science uh, course. Of course, my my mentor was Emma Caruni, so a special thanks to Emma, but it's also in the, in the last slide. So my project is how to make an open science training more effective and practical. And if you want to have access to the slides, they are uh, already on Zenodo. And uh, the same is true for the background photo because they are all mine and you can find them also on Flick to uh, reuse. So feel free to reuse. Uh, so the road, uh, the road ahead, we will see the project, the target and scope, the lessons learned, the achievements, and something for, for the future. But first of all, where I start from, I work at the University of Turin, where I'm head of the Open Science Unit, and I already give a lot of training on, on Open Science, as you, as you can see here, and I'm involved in Open Science infrastructures like uh, OPERAS and in several Horizon Europe projects. And in this Open Science Cafe, which is an interesting uh, template, which, which we uh, talk more, uh, discuss more later. So my uh, all six project was about uh, training uh, on open science, because what I see is that often uh, open science training are uh, too focused on theory. So why open science is beneficial, uh, what are the basics, the logics, and so on. So maybe a researcher can see it as too abstract, okay? So my aim was to learn about practical tools, and to use them in training to show researchers that open science practices are doable uh, so that they, they can make their research workflow more effective. Uh, lessons I learned uh, that maybe openness has many, many more colors than those I was uh, used to. Uh, I enlarged enlarge my vision on open leadership uh, because I, I used to be focused only on research, and then I got much more, uh, ma many more ideas. I discovered a lot of new tools, and of course, again, thanks to Emma, the basic of GitHub, which was my uh, a dream for, for a long time. What was particularly useful, and it, it is, this is also what I'm asking you, if it's possible for the future, uh, to get in touch with Italian speaking researchers, um, experts on, on some tools. I already got the contact of Carla and Alessio, and I've already invited them to the Open Science Cafe, which is an interesting format. It's once a month, uh, it's lasting one hour, 30 minutes presentation plus uh, 30 minutes uh, discussion, and it's very, uh, let's say, appreciated from the researchers' community because it's quick. It's easy and it's practical about uh, how to do open science on a, on, a daily, on a daily basis. So I already invited Alessio to the Open Science Cafe in June. Uh, what went wrong? Of course, time. Time is never enough. Uh, I was not able to interact uh, on Slack or being part of the community as much as I would have liked. And I also uh, watched many of the session only um, on YouTube, so the, the recording and not the live session. And I would say that the session on coding was a bit too uh, tech for me because I come from the humanity, but it was quite interesting and useful as well. Some of the achievements, I would say this slide by Basata, the idea of the data, if data are not reusable, it's just a selfie of data. I think it's worth really my participation to the, my attending to the all six. And as you can see here, I've already integrated some of the slides in my, uh, in the slides of my, my courses. And I also got some new perspective on FAIR uh, from the two sessions on, on FAIR data. So looking ahead, I would try to find out better way to, to integrate the suggestions from all six into my slides. And maybe we can think about replicating or adapting open life science uh, for the Italian community. So in Italian, because I'm also part of this ICDI Competence Center, and I'm a partner in Skills for EOS project, which is a European funded project precisely 
on upskilling researchers for, for EOSC. And maybe we can think about creating open science video peers, uh, maybe like interviews with you as experts. Um, and my last word is about, it's for you, for the, for the organizing team, because you really were amazing. You are amazing people. And thank you for your valuable support. And of course, with a special thank to Emma, because she has had a lot of passion with me. So thank you really very much to you all. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Well done. Another uh, heartfelt round of applause from everyone and this amazing idea of OLS Italiano 2024. That'll be great. <laughs> it's already in the chat. Um, you're leading the change you want to see. Lovely. Um, let's jump to um, questions. Uh, so there's there's one question that came through is there are many colors of openness as, as your slide showed. Um, are there any distinct themes of openness that you're observing within the Italian community? Oh, that, that, that's a good question because, you know, uh, the problem with open science in Italy is it, it's, it's not, it's still not known, so not so widespread. There is a, a, lot, a, a lack of awareness, I would say, because we have a very strong and uh, you know, ranking based, the journal impact factor based, national research assessment exercise. So researchers are very focused on publishing in the highest impact factor journal. They don't care about open science at all and so on. So it's, it's quite difficult. And that's why I really appreciated the, the first presentation by, by Dario. And because we, we really have to find the, 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 the few researchers already going for open science. And, and so it, it's difficult to answer because we, it, it's really, we have a huge variety. Um, so people we invited to the Open Science Cafe, they were focusing on, for instance, data visualization. So that's something that, that they are going to. Um, I would say preprints are, are almost unknown. So the use of preprints is not widespread. Uh, so it, it, it really varies a lot from disciplines, from single universities or, or even research performing organization, not, not universities. So it, it's difficult to answer, sorry. That just means it was a very good question, but also a very good answer. Thank you. Um, I mean, we already have a few Italian speakers in the group, so that's that's. I saw, I saw Maya. So please, Maya, please, yeah, yeah, yeah Maya, know, please, yeah. Let, let's let's be. Uh, let's see, yeah. Yeah, no, it will happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can't see uh, obviously a lot of support with the idea of or less Italiano. I can't see um any other questions. I do just want to mention. Although I'm, I'm not sure how close to her Italian route she is at this point, uh, Sabina Leonelli is a um, philosopher of science who works. Yeah, on I, I know her. Yeah. Exeter, there you go. That's the only name I can drop. I, <laughs> I've never spoken with her. I'd love to. She writes yeah. amazing stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other comments, final thoughts? No, I, I think some. Uh, some comments on the slides format, so feel free to reuse the, the, the photograph are, are on Flickr, so if you want to go, I, I would say it's quite difficult just because you have to pick the right slide, meaning resonating to the content of the slide, so that, that's the idea, but anyway, feel free to reuse, they are, um, they all have um, a Creative Commons license, so feel free to reuse, that, that's the scope. Okay. Brilliant. One final round of applause. Thank you. Well done. And we'll go on to um, Jennifer. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, so my project is called Open Data Custodians, and my mentor was Malvika. Oops. Oops. Skip that one. So I'll start with some quick thank yous. Thank you to the entire OLS community for um, the feedback and encouragement throughout the program and special shout out to Melvika, of course. Um, and especially for jumping in sort of last second to mentor the project. Um, 
I think what happened was, um, at least for my project, a lot of it ended up being um, around digging into the problem itself. So Malvika, thank you so much for um, having those very windy and sometimes confusing conversations with me. I think it helps bring a lot of clarity. Um, also, thank you to the Turing Way community um, for participation and feedback during a workshop um, that happened with this project and also Chris and Yassin from Big Code for some technical guidance. So I'll start uh, with digging into a bit of this confusing, complex problem um, that I described earlier. Uh, so the motivating question for the project, Open Data Custodians, was around the ethics of data scraping, and particularly around how tech companies do it to trade AI algorithms these days. I think we've all seen examples of this in the news, like in the social impact, of course, of these algorithms, such as ChatGPT and uses for potentially plagiarism. Um, also, some of the image generating AI, like Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey, in this case, uh, one of the AI won an art competition, which um, created a whole host of um, questions and concerns around that. Um, and for me, a big part of this issue is that we all know that data scraping is happening. Um, and it's largely happening without consent. Um, and sometimes it's happening on copyrighted data, but at the moment there's no real recourse or, or no real action that uh, we can take. Um, so this kind of data collection without any sort of choice by the data creator or the data subject is sometimes called something um, termed forced consent, uh, which refers to any activity where users don't have a real choice to say yes or no for how their data is used. And there's quite a many, there are quite a number of examples of this, um, unfortunately, these days. So zooming in to a specific kind of data, GitHub data, which was the focus of this project, um, we can see examples of this for GitHub repo data too. So um, GitHub, OpenAI, among others, have scraped billions of lines of code, sometimes not even open source code, in the case of Tim in the bottom right, um, to create massive data sets to train AI that can generate code. And in fact, there's now a lawsuit um, alleging that these companies are violating copyright law by reproducing open source code using for-profit AI. So just to you know, break down the pros and cons a bit, um, on one hand, it's clear that these super impressive state-of-the-art models that are very data hungry would not be possible without these massive data sets that were obtained through very fast scraping, automated scraping. Uh, but of course, on the con side, these methods are also secretive. There's often no real way to know if your data has been scraped and also extractive. Uh, we have a situation where even though the open code was obtained freely, the companies are now selling the AI back to the same communities that they scraped from. So one um, response to all of this is this data uh, stewardship framework that um, was created by an organization called Big Science, um, and their mission is around creating um, state-of-the-art AI in an open way. Um, and so OD ODC, the projects, um, aim to address this question, um, can data, data custodianship incentivize more responsible data practices? So during OLS, our goal was to create an MVP um, mapping GitHub metadata, like contributors and uh, to a file and um, their consent purposes um, to some sort of data structure. Um, and this would be the first building block to be able to capture data consent preferences from different um, contributors to a GitHub repo. And uh, we were able to work with the Turing Way community um, to investigate this question and use their repo as a test case. So in terms of technical progress, um, a lot of it was just researching what kind of metadata extraction resources were out there, like TIG on the very right, or Git log, um, and wrote a basic script to map data like file type and contributor info to a file to a pandas data frame. Um, one of the main technical findings was that um, the existing tools out there, like the GitHub API, mostly focus at data at repo level, which makes sense because you know there's so much out there, um, rather than file level. So if we wanted to capture specific information about who contributed to a piece of 
code, um, that is something um, that at least in my search, I wasn't able to find um, a resource for that. Sorry, just um, say that it's five minutes. So if you could okay, all right, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we ran a Turing Way workshop and here are some of the results from that. And um, I think this is maybe the biggest takeaway I wanted to share. So one of the biggest findings is that um, the biggest need I think is not necessarily technical, but rather social and cultural. So there's a lot of different technical pathways that we could take to, to address this problem. But um, in our workshop and conversations with Malvika and the Turingway community, we found that you know this topic of governance and decision-making around co-created data is a very new topic and not really sure um, where people land on it, or even how to start the conversation. And another new topic is that many people aren't necessarily aware that there are more opportunities now to opt out and opt in of data scraping. So um, next steps will be having more conversations like the one we had with Turnway, um, starting with some repos um, that are present in the stack, which is a massive um, data set of, of code scraped code data, and hopefully expanding the conversation to communities beyond the UK. We've just focused within the organization I work at now for ease of um, access, but it would be great to chat with some other OLS folks about um, how they think about topics like the data culture within their communities and consent. Um, so I will wrap up now, but thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll stop sharing. Amazing. Thank you. Congratulations. Another round of applause from everyone, please. Awesome. Amazing. Um, congrats. Um, are there any questions in the room um, that someone would like to ask? Uh, just, just to note, there is a kind comment from Yo, so loving the idea that the biggest need is social cultural. Um, code is easy. Human infrastructure is hard. Um, I really liked your use of the words uh, secretive and extractive, which kind of points to, you know, we're doing something really wrong if those words describe standard practice. Um, are there any other questions? Just maybe I'll just make a quick comment yeah. that um, absolutely that human infrastructure piece is something that as we've talked to different developer communities, they're just like kind of throwing up their hands. Like we have no idea how to even begin approaching this. Maybe we have some ideas for what the technical resource might look like, but but it, I guess, says to me that there's a big gap here. And um, hopefully through communities like OLS and other open communities that have invested so much in the human infrastructure and the cultural and community infrastructure, I think there's a lot um, that communities like this can add to the conversation. Amazing. There is a question that's been typed as we speak. Is there, um, are there any negative attitudes towards scraping AI? Is the question. I think so. I mean, I think because the people who create the AI um, also do a lot of great press releases around it and they tend to get hyped initially. It starts, I think, with a lot of um, positive attitudes because you know i think a lot of our first reactions are like oh that's so cool you know like how can i use this um and um that is a starting point but i think there are negative attitudes emerging now because uh we're starting to have conversations about you know how was this ai actually created what data did did they use and um you know, there's, there's, I think, a transparency problem that goes to what you're, you know, the secretive aspect um, that we discussed earlier. So I think it's ne not necessarily around what AI does, but more the process of how it was created. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And with that, I think one final round of applause. Um, congrats to everyone. I think I want to hand it over to Yo for or or, or Maviko Bernice. I mean, you're all here. Um, who would like I'll to take a baton? I've I've taken it. Um, thank you so much, also Ismail, for um, an incredible hosting job. Um, if we can have a very quick round of applause for him too. Um, 
also my friends uh in youtube we have people who have been watching uh both current OLS applicants and participants as well um sending their congratulations so thank you everyone um for all of the amazing projects you've just presented everything you've shared about your learning um I'm really excited to see where this goes and every time we end up with these amazing ideas like wow I can't wait for OLS Italiano <laughs> if we're writing a grant together just let me know <laughs> we'll figure this out um I also thank you so much, Jennifer. I really liked your presentation as a finisher, because one thing that I noticed a while ago, Maya was um, experimenting with ChatGPT, and um, some of the stuff looked like I could have written it or Malvika could have written it in terms of OLS's views. And I had this revelation that if we keep on putting all of our work out openly, it's going to scrape our work and it's going to regurgitate how important, good, ethical open compassionate work is and it's like hey we can win this game <laughs> so i felt really empowered and excited by the thought of just spreading the good stuff and i don't mind if it gets regurgitated because we're regurgitating the good stuff um so i feel really empowered by um fl flooding ai with nice things <laughs> and not just hate speech but anyway uh we're over time it has been a beautiful, slightly more than 16 week journey because we had the break in the middle. I love you all so much as incredible, amazing, open researchers, open scientists. Keep spreading the word. Sign up to be mentors, to be experts. We have faith in you. We pay for most of our roles that do work over half an hour's time. Um, anything else, Berenice or Malvika? Okay, this is the end of the OLS 6 journey, but not the end of our friendship. Don't be strangers and have a lovely day. Bye all.